every week they bring it. Man, I hope, I hope you guys know I would put our band up against any band in the world. Man, I, I hope that you're they're sitting at the feet and worshiping God through their gifts. Man, it's so good. Someday you ought to just take some of them out to dinner or lunch and say, I just appreciate you serving us every week. So let's give it up for the band leading us in worship. Man, if you, if you like restaurant analogies, um, worship is like setting the table. It's like setting the ambiance. It's like lighting the candles. It's like you're preparing the appetizers for the main course. And so when we worship well, it prepares the hearts to receive the word that's coming out. And so without further ado, we started a new series last week called Not a Consumer. And what we're driving toward is rediscovering what the purpose of the church is in our lives, what the purpose of God is within our individual giftings and within our family structure and, and where we place it inside of our priorities. And last week we started the series, in case you missed it, because I know during the summer we're going to have a lot of travel going on. I encourage you to watch online. We post every service that, that we do. And so um, last week we talked about the value that unless you see value in the relationship with God, that it'll never move you to make this choice that we're going to talk about today. So I hope you've found value in your relationship with God. I hope it's driven you to realign your priorities and your perspectives. So today's topic is for the sake of the we. What will you give for the sake of the we? What would you sacrifice for the sake of the we? What would you go without what would you be willing to change or transform about yourself for the sake of the we? And we're going to discover what the we is, and that's the collective. And for our purposes, I'm going to use this word collective, and if that's not a word that you're familiar with, it really would be team. For the sake of the team, what would you be willing to do? And then I hope that I can expand upon this team concept and get you to understand that, that when you accept Christ, you are joining his team, that, that even within that team, Every church is its own individual body or player on the team. And that when you sign up for a church, you're saying, I want to be on team Genesis Metro. I want to be on team Hope Fellowship. I want to be on team Preston Trails, all great churches in our Frisco City. And so, so today I hope that, that you would embrace your role on the team. And I want you to know that even in your marriage, it's, a, it's another type of team that you need to embrace your role. And what I want us to see is that there's a, there's a, there's competing interests between individualism and the collective, between the individual player and the grander part of the team that they're on, and that, that sometimes we get that confused as to where it is placed inside of these parameters that God has set. So without, without I have a lot of, of information to cover this morning because I told you last week, we're going to look at a model that will work in any mode, and I'm going to unwrap that model for you in just a a moment. So a template that we'll start with is uh, found in Matthew 6, 24. It says that no man can serve two masters, two masters. So here Jesus is using a strong word analogy of that of a slave in relationship to the master. Uh, and, 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 and our individualism in our American society, our, our, our Western society, we, we kind of praise the individual. We kind of praise accomplishment. And there's nothing wrong with individuality, and we'll get into that in just a moment. There's nothing wrong with accomplishment. However, Jesus said that, that you're going to be a slave to something. You're going to be a slave to something. And he says no one can serve two masters because inevitably you're going to make a choice. You're going to choose one over the other. You're going to choose to love one and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. He says no man can serve God and money. Now, this word money is actually a word called mammon, and it, it really represents earthly treasure or temporal things that are passing away. So God is setting up an, an obvious dichotomy, which this makes it easier for us to, to decipher and to choose when we have a dichotomy before us. It's really A or B. He says that there are eternal things, God things, that you can be a slave to, or you can choose temporal things, things that are passing away, things that are not going to last. He says, you have a dash between your birth and your death. How are you going to invest that limited time you have? Will it be in things that are eternal or will it be in things 
that are temporal. Now, I told you as we walk through this series, I'm going to kind of probe at you, and, and you're probably going to have some thoughts. And these thoughts you need to grab hold of because that's called enlightenment. I want you to think, if you evaluate your life right now, what is it that you're doing that is your investment in eternity? Like, right off the top of your head, what are the three things that you're doing that is investing in eternity? I think that most people that go to church on a regular basis can't think of one thing. They can't think of one thing like, what am I doing that's an investment in eternity? And the thing is, is that you probably wouldn't have to change very much of what you're doing. You would just have to change the purpose with why you're doing it. Because your marriage can be an investment in eternity. Your children can be an investment in eternity. Your service in church can be an investment in eternity. Your profession can be an investment in eternity. It just is determined on where you place it in the parameters that God has set. So God is saying that you're going to serve something. Something is going to be your master. As I start using that terminology, I just want to phrase it a little bit differently, see if we can drive this home. Have you ever, and I, I'm probably going to ask for a show of hands in here so you get to participate, because I love a sermon where we get to interact with one another. It's really, it's really not a dialogue, but we're going to pretend like it is, okay? <laughs> Consider for a moment, have you ever felt like something had power over you. Has anybody, ever, has anybody ever felt like that? Like, I think most people might even think like, at times, like maybe your job. Has anybody ever felt like that? Or like the bills? Has anybody ever, has anybody ever bowed down to the bill master? Anybody? Anybody ever here like, yes, master, I'll go get some money for you so you won't turn my light bills off. Anyway, so, so we, we have these things that sometimes they have power over us. And, and we feel somewhat helpless that we have to serve those, those things. Even if we take it a little bit further into the abstract, how about emotions? Have, have you ever been ruled by emotions that you, you wish you didn't have? Do I have any like short fuse people in here? Anybody, anybody here, is, maybe at times, like the road rage monster comes out, anybody like, or like out on the football or wherever it may be, just the competitiveness kind of gets the best of you, and, and the next thing you know, like, you're saying things and doing things and, like, at a level, and even, like, parenting, has anybody ever, like, flown off, like, a little bit too far? Like, like you know, the children are like, ah, what's going on? Like, like you, you might need, a, like, a glass of wine and a timeout. Is anybody, can I, can I get a witness? Anybody, am I talking to anybody in here that, that, like, and you see, like, it's almost like you're having out of body where you see yourself saying it or doing it, and you're like saying to yourself, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? Like, I can't believe you keep on repeating this thing. It's, it has power over you. If you had a perfect choice, you would never choose that thing. So why is it that we prefer something? Why do we choose things that we know aren't good? Why do we keep doing things that, that if, if you said to yourself, if, if I could change that, I would? Because it has power over you. It could be lust. It could be an addiction whatever it may be. It could be the praise of other people. It could be the quest and desire for power, always chasing that next level, believing that when you get to that level, then everything, and it's, it's, it's something that is a fantasy. There's no, there's no level that's going to satisfy you because what you're trying to do is build yourself up, not build the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that the wealth is, is an elusive thing, that, that it says you have it for a moment, and then it sprouts wings, and it flies away. So, so chasing after the carrot and the stick of the things of this world, it's never going to satisfy us. So, so Jesus is putting forth this truth to you that, that you're going to be a slave to something. You're going to be the slave to the things that are, of this world that are passing away that lead to heartache and regret, or you could choose me as your master. And God says, when you put your life inside of my parameters, everything will work. So I want to unfold God's model real quick. Simple structure here. We see a box. And inside of this box, that's God's parameters. That's the collective. That's the kingdom of God. That's his will. That was inside his word. That's his calling in your life. All of those things are synonymous. So here is the model that works in every mode of life. So you have to decide. So here's where you, you have the choice. You see, God made you with the power to choose. So, so none of this is going to happen on accident. If you're waiting to fall into 
God's will, if you're waiting to one day just wake up and have a blessed life where you have peace that surpasses all understanding, where you have joy to replace all the anger that's in your life, if you just think that one day you're gonna walk into church and I'm like a magician and I wave my wand and that just happens in your life, that's not the way that it works. It's a willful choice on our, beho- our, our behalf. So the, God, the life that God has planned for us is something that we must choose. We must take these pieces of our life our individualism, our goals, our family, our marriage, and we must submit them to the parameters that God has set. And as we place them inside of his parameters, it says it'll be blessed. It'll be blessed. It will produce good things. So if you look in your life this morning and it's not producing good things, if your communication isn't producing good things, if your profession isn't producing good things, if your children aren't producing good things, this is a great place to start. Ask yourself, are you living inside of the collective? Are you living inside of God's parameters for your life? As a matter of fact, if we take this model, let's push it down into marriage. So in marriage, if we broke it down and we say, okay, there's a role for the husband as an individual, there's a role for the wife, As an individual, there's a role in parenting. Then there's the the goals of the marriage. So as as we take the the big model that works for our whole life and we put this model on top of the different modes of of marriage or even business, then it just works. I'll get into the business model in just a moment, but I, I wanna touch on one thing. One thing that I see creeping up in a younger generation and it's, it's, it's not that it, it's not as applied to all generations, but, but I see something that, that I just wanted to touch on, all right? Just, just a little, if y'all will, y'all permit me, you don't have a choice, but, but you just permit me for a moment to speak into this codependent style of relationships that is being promoted in our culture today. I wanna help you out, I wanna help you out. If you're, if you're newlywed, all right, uh, I wanna help you out. If you've been married for 10 years and you're doing it wrong, I wanna help you out, okay? And so, so here's the thing, there's, there's like a philosophy that's being ingrained in our society that we have to do everything together, all right? Everything must be done together. That is not good, all right? That's not healthy. Let me give it to you in a business analogy. What if the accountant said, we're gonna go out and we're gonna do sales? Have you met very many accountants? They're not usually salespeople. Can I get an amen? I mean, they, they, they're like, they're great at what they do, but they're not like, you know, go out and like, hey, how's it going today? You want to crunch some numbers in a spreadsheet? No, that's the sales guy goes out, hey, let's play around golf. Let's go do whatever. Let's build a relationship. But what if the salesman had to do the accounting? You know, oh my gosh, you're right? Like, oh, where's that? I don't know. I don't know. You know they, they, oh, well, it doesn't really matter as long as it goes. No, it doesn't matter. Like tell an accountant that a receipt doesn't matter. Like they will freak out, okay? No, it matters. And so, so they have roles. You have an individual role within the collective of the team. Man, these parents that say of their newborn, like say the baby's up at like 2 a.m. is crying, and they have this mindset it's like, well, if I'm gonna suffer, you're gonna suffer with me, you get up. And now both of them are exhausted, so what happens at 6 a.m.? Who, who's gonna be, what happens when you go to work the next day if you don't have refreshment? Then all of a sudden, your desire for equal suffering inside of the collective, not embracing your role. See, you have a role and they have a role and when everybody does their role, you remain your individuals inside of the collective and you do what's best for the team. So whenever we have a, a selfish mentality that says, well, I suffered so you suffer, that's terrible. Can I get it? Amen, that's just terrible. That's, that's terrible thinking. We wanna do what's best for the team to promote our joint success. And God says inside of marriage, you retain your individuality, but you surrender it to what's best for the collective. If you take this model and you apply it to your marriage and you're always doing what's best for the relationship, then you will succeed. It's inevitable. You can't fail if both people agree to those parameters. Same thing with business. You could ask yourself, are my business goals aimed at promoting the kingdom? You could do it so many ways. You could say, well, if I make more, that just means I have more to give. Or am I providing opportunities for other people to provide for their families? That's a great thing that's in business. Am I striving for a promotion just so I can have more influence to shine a light? If you're in the service industry, and let's say you're a doctor, you're a nurse, what an incredible opportunity to literally be the hands and feet that serve the hurting in this world. You see, if you don't think correctly about the parameters that God has set for your profession, for your family, 
for your business, for your marriage, for your parenting, then you're going to miss out because I'm going to show you what man's model looks like. I want you to see some contrast here. See, in man's model, we have the box of God's will. And this is not really focusing on unbelievers today. This is focusing on how Christians typically do life. This is the, the, the average, the majority of Christians in this world. We kind of say, okay, there's some things that go in God's box, all right? I'm gonna put faith, obviously, can't have faith without God. So I'm gonna put faith, that's, that's God's, all right? My faith, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the savior of the world. Can I get, amen, yes, Jesus. High five Jesus, gives me eternal life. Don't have to go to hell, yes, faith. So then I might put, you know, marriage, you know, that goes, I, I, I gotta give that to God, right? I mean, because he gave me that wife, he gave me the husband. And so, you know, I, I'll give that to him. Children, of course, you know, they're a heritage of the Lord. I got it. And then, and then you start thinking about your goals for life, your goals for life. And I, I kind of put that like where it kind of straddles there because what happens is you pick, right? There are some goals that you're gonna say, okay, that's under God's banner. But then you'll inevitably find yourself investing in these things, this mammon that Jesus talked about, and those things will be outside of God's will. Now they can be like worldly things that are good causes. But what if you substituted a good cause, like you wanted to raise $10 million for a charity, good cause. What if you gave nothing to the church? If we save the body, but we condemn the soul, what's the greater good? I'm not saying don't give money to charity. I'm just saying there's one investment that leads to eternal life change. And there's only one cause. There's only one cause that's, that's great, and that's the church. And so, if we see things correctly, it gives us a lens through which we can appropriately place and invest for eternity. So, so here we see that, that we, we have goals. Some are inside, some are outside. And then we have individualism. And this is where the problem really lies. Um, second point on your outline. Individualism without parameters is poison. Individualism without parameters is poison. Now we'll put the model back up. You see, this will describe original sin. So go with me in your mind for just a moment. The God of all creation. Got my mom, yes, back up there. The God of all creation, he speaks the world into existence. And that's impressive just in and of itself, right? I mean, that you could just say earth and there was earth. You could say sky and there's sky. If you believe in evolution, show me your evidence. Show me your evidence that you could have design and intricacy on accident. Show me, show me one thing in life where you have design and intricacy that happened on accident. I will show you every time that there's design and intricacy, the more complex, the more ne ne necessary there is for design. And the, the creation is infinitely complex, therefore it must have an infinite designer. And so we call him God, by the way. And so, so, so as you're considering this God, <laughs> here he, he puts these parameters into place and he, he creates Adam. And then on top, on top, of, like after he's topped it all off of, of all great things in creation, he gives him a smoking hot wife named Eve, all right? And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. I'm not gonna give you a theology lesson in that, but that was, that was, that was good, right? He said, all things, Adam, it's yours, right? All things, Eve, it's yours. You guys enjoy what I've created from the ends of the earth. If you wanna go to the Bahamas, just go knock yourself out. It belongs to you. Here are the keys to the world. Wrap, wrap your mind around that for just a moment. It's all yours. It's all yours. Imagine if you owned the world, how great life would be. No stress. There's no bills. There's no suffering. There's no disease. There's no death. I mean, it couldn't get any better. There was just, just one little tree sitting over here in the garden. He said, just, just don't touch that. Don't even, don't even look at Don't even mess with that over there. And Adam and Eve, this force came walking in the garden one day. And we call him Satan. We call him the, the author of the father of lies, the tempter. See if you know him. He came walking into the garden. He said, don't you know God is lying to you? Don't you? There is so much fun to be had right over here, and God's just trying to keep you from it. 
God has an ego complex. He knows that if you were to experience that, you'd be equal to him, and he's just trying to keep this from you. You see, temptation always comes with, with someone taking a truth, God was trying to keep it from them, and twisting it because the motivation of God was to keep them from pain. The motivation of the enemy was to cause them pain. And then we choose things outside of God's parameters, and they always cause us pain because there's poison in individualism when it goes outside of the parameters of God. And so they grab a hold of the forbidden fruit. They reach outside of the parameters that God has set, believing, believing that God didn't know what was best for their life. I know, I know I've got to be preaching to someone in here today. Is any, any, am I talking to anybody in here that has ever reached outside of the parameters that God has set? Because the me monster will consume you and everyone around you. It will consume every relationship whenever you choose you, the me, above the we of the collective. Think about how every, every marriage breaks down. It starts with someone saying, I'm gonna take my individualism, I'm gonna put it outside. What I want in the relationship is more important than what's best for the relationship. You see, the collective always has to supersede the individual, and the individual has to surrender to what God's will is, and whenever they surrender, they raise the white flag because here's the truth. You wouldn't have to think very long in your catalog, your Rolodex of memories to think, have you ever reached outside? Has anybody ever experienced the pain of reaching outside of God's will? That you, you grabbed a hold of the forbidden, you grabbed a hold of the thing you knew you shouldn't touch. And what does it do to your heart? What does it do to your soul? You begin to feel dead inside. You, you begin to go to this place where you don't feel love. You don't feel joy. You become numb and you walk through life and relationships not being able to give something because you're living outside of the parameters of God. Don't you want to have something to give the people you love? Don't you want to have something to invest in the people that you say are closest to you? When you choose your individual will above what God has said, every time it will poison the relationships around you. No man can serve two masters. Either it's inside the parameters of God or it's outside and it's going to cost you. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, how do we move from consumer to contributor? How, how do we, inside of our marriage, how do we move from consumer to contributor? Inside of our church, our team, Genesis Metro, how do we move from consumer to contributor? Because there's a season for consuming, for maturing, but then the majority of your faith is to be lived out in giving, investing, teaching others what God has taught you. And so I, I, I think that we, we failed somewhere along the way to realize the progression. And we're holding ourselves to a standard that is less than what God has asked for. God has asked for that we hold ourselves to the standard of how can I give in my marriage? It's not about what I stand to get. It's about how can I give? How can I give in my parenting, not using my children to try to prop up my happiness? How can I give in my church rather than always just receiving? And so if we start to look at it from a contributor's mindset, I had three points of reference for you today. Number one is that the cause has to come above your comfort. If you want to transition from consumer to contributor, we have this story that's in Luke chapter 21. And to get the, the backdrop for it, there was this, this church atmosphere that had been created in which the, the priests had this ultimate power over the people. They could tax them, they could take advantage of them, and they were using their position as an advantage to them. So it wasn't about people, it was about themselves, their position. And so Jesus was looking at how people were praying these, these big flowery prayers, our thrice most illustrious holy God, infinite in all wisdom and teaching. I wanna pray to thee, O Father. I mean, you know, like how, how educated can I sound and how, how godly can I sound in my prayer? And then they would give these flowery 
flashy offerings and, and then they desired the best seats because they wanted to be seen of other people. And so they'd taken church and turned it into something that was, was terrible. I mean, uh, 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 I almost said a different word there, but I'm not gonna say that word right now. Anyway, uh, a terrible mockery of what God intended for it to be. And in the midst of this scene that Jesus is, is pretty upset with, and he only got upset with one group of people. Did y'all ever notice that? It was always like the hyper-religious, like people that think they're better. Like Jesus really did not like those people. I mean, like I think we kind of pretend that Jesus was always like, bless you, bless you, bless you. But for those people, he said, you're a den of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes. You know, one day you're gonna get what's coming to you. That was Jesus to those people. And so I want you to know that we will never celebrate hyper-religious piety in here. Can I get, can I get a witness? Like, like we believe we're all broken and we're all messed up. And so if you are someone who has it all together, you need to go find another church because you will be disappointed with our people because they're just a bunch of sinners, all right? Just a bunch of sinners up in here. And so um, here we are and, and Jesus is, is witnessing this crowd and Jesus takes time to teach us an incredible lesson about cause above comfort. He says there was this, there was this widow and all these wealthy people were, were around her and they were splashing the, the hundreds, maybe the thousands, splashing it in the plate. I'm like, hey, watch this, boom. Drop that big check in there. Oh, pastor, did you see that? And then there was this little widow. And you know, you could see her kind of hobbling up there and she reaches in her little purse and says she had two copper coins, widow's mites in the Bible, but for our purposes, pennies, two pennies. Picks her two pennies drops it in there. Man, no one noticed. In that religious, hyper-regal scene of people, it's about appearance on the outside, not about what's on the inside. Nobody cared. Nobody celebrated two pennies in the offering plate. But Jesus, Jesus noticed. Something Something grabbed the heart of God. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to do an exercise of what impresses God? Think about that for a moment. I know that we give a lot of practical messages and sometimes uh, some have said, you know, that, you know, Genesis Metro, like we don't go deep enough. Well, buckle up, buckle up, buttercup. Here comes some depth coming at you right now, all right? Hope you're ready for this, all right? You hyper spiritual person that think you got it all together, just get ready, all right? Just get ready. I'm pow, coming at you, all right? If God made it all, right? Think about this for a moment. If he made it all, if he owns it all, and you are a little ant in all of his creation, right? I mean, compared to the world, compared to the billions of people that have ever walked this earth, you occupy a small smidgen of time, right? And your time is inside of his eternity. So, right? Are you, are you following? Are you rapping? Okay. He owns it all. He made it all. He lets you have a little bit, right? He lets you have a little bit. You have your little house. You have your little car. You have your little breath. Your heart is beating. And it's all because he allows it this morning. Are you aware? Are you aware of who is ultimately in control of your fate, your destiny, and your time, and all your treasure? You only have it because he lets you have it this morning, okay? So if we can just wrap our mind around that, what material thing could you ever bring to the God of all creation that he would stop and go like, wow, wow, wow. You brought me a car, you brought me a McLaren, you brought me an island in the South Pacific and you're giving that to me? How could he ever be impressed by a material thing if he owns all of it? Are you, are you tracking with me this morning? So what impresses the heart of God? It's not the zeros, it's not the zeros in the check. It's the heart, right? Can I, get, can I get an amen? It's the heart. It's the heart. He saw sacrifice. Do you know what impresses the heart of God? Sacrifice. A heart that says, I care more about the cause than I do about my comfort. He said, you all gave out of your wealth. You put something in there and it cost you nothing to splash the pot with your sacrifice. He said, but she gave out of her poverty. As a matter of fact, she gave all that she had to live that week. She had the heart of sacrifice. She cared more about the desire to contribute than she did for her personal desire for comfort. Oh man, does that sound 
Does that sound deep enough to anybody in the house? I mean, could, could we all just try to take one step of depth today to try to get to the point that in relationships, we care more, we care more about the cause of marriage than we do about our personal comfort. We care more about the cause of Christ than we do about buying the next shiny trinket and toy that is passing away. You can only have one master. At some point, you're gonna have to choose between the two, cause above comfort. Next one, cause above applause. Cause above applause. I've been waiting to say that line because it rhymes and I like it. Cause above applause. In John 3.30, John the Baptist says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, if you don't know the backdrop, John the Baptist was the Billy Graham of his culture. John the Baptist was the greatest preacher of his era. John the Baptist had the biggest crowd that was following him, followers that were willing to die for him. And here comes Jesus on the scene, competing for the same crowd. Now, if you've built something, don't you think that you might be loyal to what you built? Don't you think you might be protective of what you built? Don't you, don't you think you might be tempted to go, no, 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 this is mine, God, I built this. John the Baptist instantly recognizes who Jesus is, and he says, I would rather serve the cause than have the applause of men. He said, I must increase. If I have to take a step back, that Jesus might shine a little brighter, then I gladly pay that price, is what John the Baptist said. I wonder if there's anything, anything that's in our individualism that when we meet Christ, there might be something that we have to take a step back in order for him to shine a little brighter. Can I get a witness in here this morning? Is there anything that's in your life that, that God says, I want that and I need that. I need you to surrender that in order for me to shine a little brighter. And we say, no, 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 God. You can have everything, but not that. I don't even have to tell you what it is because the Holy Spirit fills it in for me right now. Right now in this moment, you have something that you say, no, 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 this is my marriage, God. That's not your marriage. You stay out of this. That's my, these are my kids. These are my kids. I don't know. Are you taking your kids and putting them outside of the parameters of God? Are you making choices predicated on what you want for them? Not even considering what God might have for them? Would you rather them have a blessed material life and make hundreds of thousands of dollars and have broken relationship and broken family and broken kids and broken everything in their life, broken hearts? Or would you rather them have God's will in their life and they, they live through a meager existence on this world, making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 or a missionary somewhere, living below the poverty line here in America, but impacting eternity. Which one do you want for your kids? Is it even in the consideration? Have you ever prayed like, God, your will for my kids? Your will, God, for your kids? Do you think it would shift some things if you started looking at it from God's perspective? I, maybe. God, your cause above all applause. The last one. The cause brings us clarity. Here's a tough one. You have to lose in order to win in love. You have to lose in order to win in love. The Apostle Paul teaches us this truth in Philippians chapter three. He says, whatsoever I've gained up to this point, I now count as loss. Now, watch this. All the individual accolades that I have. I mean, he was Pharisee of the year. I mean, he, he was recognized as the guy on the council of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, of Benjamin. I mean, anything that you could put in the pedigree, we would put like Harvard Law. I mean, he's clerked on the Supreme Court. I mean, everything that you could ever want and be recognized for was the Apostle Paul. And now he meets Christ. And he says, all the things that I thought were gain, all the things that I had worked for, all the things that I had lusted after, he said, now we're lost. They were meaningless. They no longer brought me joy. They no longer brought me satisfaction. I found something that was greater than the things that were in this world. All the things, all the things that were gained, I now count as lost. As a matter of fact, I've suffered the loss of all things for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. 
knowing Christ. Now, now, now watch this. He says that knowing Christ was more valuable than anything else in his life. Last verse. It says, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and even in his, his death. And in between services, I inspired myself, believe it or not. And, and, and sometimes I'm looking back through notes and I'm like, dude, watch this. The power of the resurrection. And then it says, becoming like him in his death. How do you know the power of the resurrection without death? How do you know it? How, how would you know the power of the resurrection if there wasn't a death that preceded the power of the resurrection? Like the resurrection only happens after something was lost. Jesus lost his life in love so that you can win. Are you hearing me this morning? You, can't, you couldn't win without him losing. He had to lose his life at the cross so that you might know the power of the resurrection. The only way that you can know the love of God is to lose yourself inside of the relationship. He says, no man can serve two masters because you will always love the one and hate the other. This morning, who, who is your master? Who is your master? Are you the captain of your own ship? How many icebergs are you gonna have to hit before you realize it would be better if Jesus was leading this thing? Can I get, can I get an amen this morning? Man, the Apostle Paul said, when I lose, I win. What if in your marriage, it wasn't about winning, it was about losing? What if you were losing yourself in the relationship so that you could promote the love you have for your wife? You think that might inspire a different response than the constant fighting that you get? What if, what if you lost when it came to your kids? You lost what you wanted for their life and, and you, you try to start instilling them, whatever it is that God wants in your life, that would be success. Man, if you're thinking about it, Jesus constantly preaches. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Lose yourself, love God. And then love others like you love yourself. Lose yourself to the cause of others. As a matter of fact, Jesus demonstrated this in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So in other words, his individual will as a man was to try to avoid the pain, avoid the suffering. But his godliness said, I will surrender my individual will for the cause, for the cause of the collective. I would rather save the people and go through the personal pain. I would rather have the sacrifice of myself so that they might win in life. You see, if you want to win in love, you have to lose, you have to lose. And the more you lose of yourself, the more you will find love. And I'm telling you, it just works. It just, if you tried God at that level for a month, just a month of real Christian living, cause above comfort, cause above applause, then that cause will ultimately give you clarity with which you can make decisions. Many of you constantly go through life, tell me if I'm preaching to you this morning, and you don't know which way to go. You don't know which way to go. You're tempted to even reach outside of those parameters. Some of you might be facing temptation right now. This very morning, there's temptation waiting for you on the other end of a text. What is it that gives you clarity that keeps you from jumping off the edge to your death? What is it that keeps you? What is it that saves you? I'm telling you to know him. The surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ is what will keep you. It's what will save you. It's what will protect you. Really, at the end of the day, it's the classic love story. See if anybody can relate to this. Have you ever seen a movie plot where it unfolds like this? There's a guy or there's a girl, and they are the person looking for love. And there's this other guy or this other girl, and they are right there in front of them as kind of like the friend and the guide, and they're trying to help them. Now, this person is secretly in love with the person, but they don't know it. Can I get anybody following me? And this person that they're secretly in love with, they are constantly looking for love in all the wrong places, right? And, and you watch it unfold, and as the viewer, as the, as the person that's taking in the director's grums, you're, you're watching them, and, and they always pick some terrible person. Have you ever noticed this? 
I mean, you, 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 you're watching, like, Danny Zuko is out dancing with the girl in the black dress, and, and like, poor Sandy's just sitting over there like, what? I thought we had something, right? And so, so you, as an audience member, you're, like, you're like kind of, like, rooting, like, for this person to, like, experience enlightenment. Like, why do you keep choosing all these wrong people? Why do you keep choosing all of these wrong things? And you're like, come on, man, wake up. And that person is always like, well, I think love has to be complex. I think, I think love has to hurt me somehow. And, man, if someone is hurting you constantly, I'm going to clue you in. They don't love you. That's not love. Can I get a witness in here? That's not love. That's not love. And we, we, we kind of like want things that are going to hurt us. And we think that, oh, no, I'm going to change them. I'm going to change them. You're not going to change nothing. I'm going to tell you right now. They're going to be the, if you marry someone that's going to hurt you now before you say I do, they're going to hurt you forever, forever, forever. I'm telling you right Choose someone who is what you want before you marry them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't choose what you hope they'll be. Can I get a witness? Anybody? Anybody in here? Choose who you want them to be before you say I do. Because what, when you say, once you say I do, it's done. That's done. All right? So anyway, we're rooting for these people to find this love. And then after this person is always chasing after unicorns that don't exist, and the person they pick is flippant with their love, they don't care. They move on to someone else. They always break this person's heart. And then we find them at this kind of pre-climax part of the movie where they're sitting there and now they're distraught and they're disheveled and they're just like, you know, gosh, why did I pick that person? And who's there? Who's there? Sandy. Sandy's there. Sandy's like, I've been here all along. I've been here. Love was right in front of you all along. Love was, love was right in front of you and you didn't see it. I wonder if you could transpose that picture onto God. He's created you. He's loved you. He's done everything for you. He's the friend that's constantly trying to help you get through all of this stuff, all this crap. And you keep going looking for love in all of these terrible places. You keep wanting the world to love you. You keep on doing relationships in a worldly way. And you keep saying, no, 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 it's going to work. It's going it's to work this time. It's going to work this time. And every time it breaks your heart, how much pain do you want before you realize that something has to change and it changes your choice? It's your choice. That's the only thing that stands between you and the blessing of God is your choice. This morning, love has been standing in front of you all along. Your completeness is standing right, your freedom out of the slavery that you've been in is standing right in front of you. At some point, you have to say, I'd rather do it God's way. And the moment that you say yes to God's way is the moment everything is going to start to work in your life. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we ask in the name of Jesus that you take this truth and you set people free. There's people standing on the edge of temptation wanting what they know is going to hurt them. They keep going back to the same thing over and over again, even though it hurts them over and over again, because we have this power over us this power called sin, this power called lust, this power called greed. And unless we choose you, God, at the supreme level, unless we surrender our life and our rights and we become a slave to the cause of Christ, we will always fall victim to the world and its heartbreak. God, I pray that you would give us clarity this morning to know the power of the resurrection that's on the other side of choosing to die inside of our choices and our will. God, pray, drive this truth home and change families today. God, we ask these things in your name. Would you guys stand as we worship?